of the distribution question. Have you guys, ha, Sacred Cow, how, I see it in the media, but is it educationally distributed or how is that working for you? I just got my Q2 statement, two grand. Q1 was two grand. So I've made a total of $4,000 on that. And so how do you, how do you <laughs> compete with, because you know Game Changers and all of these other vegan films have so much money coming in, like it seems like you're doing a great job fighting the good fight, but there's so much money on the other side with the media, and then Joaquin Phoenix has a film coming out. Like, what yeah, what um, do we do about all that? I did meet with Netflix, um, and for a while it looked like it was going to be a Netflix original, and um, they were going to actually help produce it. And so we were hopeful they sat on it for way longer than they told me they were going to sit on it. So we were anxiously waiting, and uh, and then someone up the flagpole said no way. So that's what happened. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy by the name of uh, Jim Greenbaum who made, uh, I think, somewhere in the range of about $300 million in the telecom industry. Uh, and he works for the Humane Society. And you'll find him on the uh, producers of pretty much every vegan documentary out there. His whole goal is to find whatever niche is currently active, uh, whatever political struggle, uh, societal struggle is going on right now, and then create a film around it. So he's got, uh, Joaquin Phoenix has got one on zoonotic disease. It'll tell everybody to go vegan. Uh, he was involved in seaspiracy, cowspiracy, with the health, uh, pretty much everyone that's out there. So that's the amount of money that's kind of going into influencing people to get into the distribution realm of it. Um, so the money's already there. We just need to find the equal person for the ancestral films and media. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who that is, but. Well, I mean, we were really excited to get Nick Offerman on board, and he, you know, contrary to his character on Parks and Rec, he's um, he's very intelligent and sensitive and, and um, politically active um, and thinks there's absolutely nothing progressive about being vegan, um, although he considers himself progressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but he didn't have the pull that, that we needed either to really get us um, onto Netflix, unfortunately. But we thought for sure, once we got him on board, that that would really help. Um, we've had a lot of interest from schools, like high school science teachers, um, and some universities, uh, but it just, you put so much energy into it, and then it's like, I just got to move on. <laughs> and it was, it was crowdfunded, so uh, it was people who gave small donations and everything like that, so it didn't set us in the hole to, to produce the film, and we're entirely grateful for everybody who donated and sponsored it and got the word out there and all of that stuff. It's uh, as opposed to all of these other documentaries that are funded by these things that essentially recycle the same, you know, like we're gonna save the planet through techno-utopian ideas. I think it's really reached this point now where, uh, you know, uh, for us it was, we, we just need to put the information out there. Uh, and it's not an inflammatory documentary. I mean, it's not <laughs> something we, we sought to go and, you know, create propagandistic uh, you know, emotional elements that would hook people in. We just wanted to bring balance to the discussion. Can you tell us a little bit about all the young people who are... Um, At the end? Yeah, they're so great. I, I told Diana this morning, I found myself just grinning from ear to ear. I was so happy at the end of the film and so happy that the couple we started with Thank you. Um, as for those ones at the end, um, and actually, my assistant Meg is here. Thank you, Meg, for helping so much on so many things. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so she helped. Uh, we basically just put a call out, um, mostly through the Savory Institute network. So for those of you who don't know the Savory Institute, but they actually teach farmers around the world uh, through hubs. Uh, so it's uh, it's information that's custom to that region, um, how to do regenerative farming. 
And so almost all of the young farmers at the end are all savory. Um, from all over? From all over. So they have, they have hubs in Turkey and I mean, we had a Maasai farmer in there, um, all over the place, lots of South America. So it was really nice. It was great. Thank you. I mean, I'm sure you had to make decisions about what to develop or you know, what you're actually going to put um, into the film. And I was wondering if you, know, you can talk a little bit about, like, because I know it's one thing you talk about the Savory Institute and so on, the sort of reversing the certification, which you kind of went into a bit with the ranch in Mexico. But kind of what, how you decided, and sort of like what thing, what messages would you like to get out that you couldn't get into the movie? Oh my gosh. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. So I started this project um, and reached a point where I didn't really know how to move forward because I was doing it all on my own. Um, and I was like, is this a docu-series? Because there's so much to tell, right? I could have done a whole 10 series just on nutrition, right? Um, and so that's when I called James like desperate for help um, and just to, just to how to even construct it. And so we decided that, um, or he recommended that, that the environmental story be the biggest piece of the film, so in the book, it's nutrition, environment, ethics, like equally. Um, but we just felt for the film, the environmental story was the the one we needed to focus on the most. Um, film is not like the best medium for just information, where the book is so information heavy and it's not a, like a narrative. We tried initially when we first started filming to actually make it a story about people. So. The initial story was actually tracking uh, Sarah Hallberg's work um, in Lafayette, Indiana with reversing type 2 diabetes with keto. And um, she was our launching point for health stories, environmental stories. So actually that couple in Indiana, that's who supplies Sarah Hallberg with her meat. Um, but we just, it got really complicated because the town where she practices, Lafayette, is really, really poor. And so it just became so clear that there's so much going on with their health stories that had nothing to do with not knowing what to eat, right? It, there was just so much heavy other things holding them back from achieving um, great health. So like everybody in here who you know, worries about longevity and optimal health, that's a privilege that a lot of people just don't have, period. Um, so anyhow, so, so James came on and then we started kind of honing in a little bit more on the environmental story and then we pulled in a writer who watched every single video, didn't even know what a ruminant was. What a ruminant was. <laughs> she had to look it up like in the dictionary and in one month, she had a script based on all of the interviews, weaving everything in and out, like genius. Um, so she really saved the project. Her name's Callie. Um, she works at WGBH in Boston or on projects there. And so once we had that, then everything like really clicked into place. So it was really just having that writer help articulate um, what I was trying to say, but yeah. James and I would have made the film if it was just James and I. It would have been like ten hours long, yeah. <laughs> because then, everything's so precious. You don't yeah. want to f lose anything. There was, uh, yeah, the cutting room floor was insane. But I, I think we found, as we we've been following this for a very long time, we found this real sort of paradigm shift in 2008 with Livestock's Long Shadow, uh, where I think the nutritional and overall long-term outcomes for health was really starting to veer away from vilifying red meat uh, for all of that. Uh, and so I don't think that uh, a lot of these idealistic or ideological movements really had a good sense of what they were gonna do next until that paper came out. I mean, you see this huge pivot uh, to what we're dealing with now. And so for us, we had 90 minutes to, in essence, kind of dispel five documentaries worth of vegan work. Uh, Without making it seem reactionary. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to be more just cattle and meat are, can be good. You probably have addressed this in the book because it's such a great. 
glaring problem. But do you see ways in which the film, you could leverage the film to inspire the younger generation, both those in farming families who, you know, seem to be largely aging out of, of farming and ranching because they're just an, old, an older subset. So the people who are growing up in those families, but then also new people who might be inspired to take on farming who aren't growing up in, in ranching families and could get excited by the film, do the environmental as aspect of, hey, I'm gonna take charge and I'm gonna embrace this, even though I wasn't thinking of before. I think there's a growing movement today already of young people who are environmentalists, they wanna work with their hands, they wanna be outside and they're becoming farmers and ranchers, for sure. That's, that's growing. Now you see, you know, schools like Vassar having a sustainable agriculture major, right? So it's very trendy right now. We'll see how many of those actually end up becoming hardworking real farmers that, that are doing it. The, one of the biggest um, issues to becoming um, a farmer or rancher is just access to land and capital. Um, so it's just hard, especially now with COVID, um, having made so many people remote, now the price of suburbia and, and more rural areas has really gone up because people don't need to live so close to work anymore. Um, so it's making it even more challenging for access to land and, and capital. So there are some programs that are set up to help with either land transitions. Um, there's one called Land for Good that actually works with aging farmers and helps them with a transition process to make sure that that always stays as a farm. Um, so there's, there's organizations like that out there now. I started a nonprofit uh, in New York City and we worked for about 10 years, uh, mainly in inner city schools. Uh, and when I first started out, nobody was really talking about food. Um, and I've noticed a real sort of transformational change in the way that everybody is talking and wanting transparency and where their food is coming from. And I think Pilar's documentary really goes into all the, the level at which the Global South is feeding the Global North. Uh, I, I talked to a Malaysian farmer uh, at one of our conferences and the suicide rate there is absolutely insane because everything is ex extracted from these environments brought to factories in the global north and then resold as like ultra palatable processed foods to these farmers and farmers communities. Uh, and so you can only ex extract for so long. Palm oil is, is one of them. It's in 70% of all ultra processed foods. Uh, it came about because of the trans fat ban, right? So how do you create a fat that's stable at room temperature? Uh, yet you can still cook with it, um, it's and it's super cheap because you can grow it uh, with, with, um, with slavery. Uh, and so I think that's probably happening in the coconut trade as well. I think um, people are kind of waking up to that and they're demanding a real change. But meanwhile, we have this whole like UN Food Summit that's essentially giving carte blanche to these guys to do it under the name of efficiency and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So and you're going to hear those, yeah, <laughs> and emissions. <laughs> and you're going to hear all of those buzzwords coming out, uh, efficiency, efficiency. And we're seeing Tyson is gathering up every single, like, uh, you know, large confined animal f feeding operation. You're going to see all of these real structural changes all under the name of, like, of saving us from ourselves. So that's what the next film's about. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dan. Uh, um, I have a question, question here. Um, I was wondering if you've maybe uh, given some thought to advocacy or exploring the non-food uses of animal products. So you mentioned earlier that um, uh, uh, cattle hides in Australia are actually being thrown away. Um, where is that? You know, uh, cow leather was actually very, very versatile Now you hear a lot of people talking about vegan leather, which is just basically plastic, and it degrades. You know, I, I see this in like car dashboards where they make it out of synthetic stuff, and then it, you know, the sun hits it and it's gone in five years, and then it evaporates. Uh, it's almost as, as if it gets sticky, and then it just uh, sheds into the environment. All these like microplastics. Yeah. So I was wondering if there's any, you know, possibly any synergy that we can kind of use this as a mm -hmm. front to attack. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, these earrings are from White Oak Pastures from Regenerative Leather. Oh, I love those. <laughs> they have the best Instagram posts. <laughs> they do, definitely. I'm actually doing a workshop there in October um, for influencers and health practitioners where it's uh, farm tours and then in the afternoons, like classroom with me. Um, White Oak Pastures blew my mind when I finally went there. Bluffton, Georgia, it is like the poorest county in Georgia and what this farmer has done there is incredible. He's built a slaughterhouse. He's does regenerative grazing with all of his cattle. He, his office is the old courthouse. Uh, the church in town, like this town was just empty. The church is the administrative building. Um, he's got a general store and a restaurant. I mean, he's created so many jobs. Like this, there's no success story better than this farm. Um, but uh, we're doing, um, Meg and I are working on some fiber um, regenerative fiber uh, and and other products uh, to, to talk about them a lot more in the fall. Um, I saw a image of Greta Thunberg in wool um, talking about how this is actually a good choice for the environment. That's huge um, because you know all the Patagonia fleeces of pl those are plastic. Um, so I think there's going to be more awareness of you know better and worse ways of production. Um, there's a really cool wool company that I'm going to be working with. So yeah. That's great news. Thank you. Yeah. Have you speaking of Patagonia? Have you looked into working with them? They're huge into regenerative food products. They yes, I tried. <laughs> and they're actually. Oh, I tried everybody. <laughs> you didn't have any luck with them? No, I applied for a grant and. Yeah, they don't do a lot with beef. Um, they do a lot with bison. Bison have a unique halo over them that cattle don't because they're seen as yeah. beautiful and natural where cattle are seen as like evil and <laughs> devilish when they're practically the same animal, you know? Um, and you can do great grazing with both of them. I mean, bison have their own challenges because they're really hard to handle. They, they you can't just, load them on a trailer and bring them to a slaughterhouse the same way you can do with cattle. Um, they, don't, they don't like people very much. <laughs> so they often have to be field harvested. Animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, but I have not seen um, Patagonia really get behind beef. Um, I don't even think in Patagonia provisions there are any beef products. I think it's mostly like yeah, salmon, salmon and bison like and that, yeah. things that seem more eco meats. Well, I mean, they do do regenerative wool. Y yes, Stuff. but then they also do sell plastic wool too, a lot of it. Oh yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> if we just have to watch it again after the full trial, and, and is there like a place that we can pay for another viewing? Sure, yeah, Amazon, iTunes, it's on Amazon oh, Prime. Oh, okay, excellent. Yep, and I think it's starting to screen on like the Vudu and whatever those other like screening services are. Meg secretly runs the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, 
So there's a lot of organizations like that, um, and in fact, even um, Senator Wyden's office uh, from Oregon saw the film, and um, I'm working with them on, on an initiative to get more regenerative grazing on public land. Um, unfortunately, most people who are on board with conservation are vegetarian, and so they can get on board with conservation grazing, regenerative grazing, but the fact that I say meat is a healthy food and important is a no-go. And so that was actually a huge hurdle for me with funding. Cool. So, um, or, or that I, I say, you know, if someone can't afford regenerative beef, they should still feed their kids meat. Mm -hmm. uh, that's absolutely not okay to, I'd say, 90% of the people I approached for funding for the film. Well, I don't think, I'll just finish, it's a big lift All of them are. Even the farm in Mexico that's doing all that great work, he sends his yeah. cattle to a feedlot to finish. But I couldn't get into that in the film. That's too yeah. complicated to explain. But you can still do amazing grazing. And, and if it's more economical to the farmer, you can't fault the farmer for selling it to a feedlot if that's you know what he needs to do. He's right. so, just, uh, sorry, another question. Just you got my mind going here. Some of the biggest conservation groups in the country are hunters groups. Mm -hmm. I've working with them at all. A lot of those are farmers and a lot of the hunters. Yeah, I was on Steve Ranella's podcast. Um, I, a lot of the hunter groups, though, are wild meat or no meat. It's like uh, anyone but the owl group. Like, you know, I'll agree with you on all this, but if you don't agree with me on this little thing, then I won't talk to you. So it's, it's a challenge. So it seems like the biggest issue that we could probably all agree on, even like the animal rights people, maybe not, but a little bit closer is if the, the um, big industrial farming feedlots were reformed somehow. I mean, I can't imagine when the animal rights people say like, you know, like don't eat any more meat, I'm kind of wondering like where the cows, they're gonna be wandering around the street, they're gonna be like, grazing in people's backyard, like what exactly, like can you imagine in an ideal world how that whole system could be transformed? Yeah, I mean, I've been to a bunch of feedlots and they're not all like these awful evil places that are torturing animals and downing cows and all this kind of stuff. Um, well, if you drive up north and the one on the, south, on the right, like it's like a million, I mean, it yeah. appears like there are millions of cows can't even imagine that they're treated well or they're like laying in you know mud and it just doesn't look very yeah. humane so like how how can that bridge be formed yeah there's there's definitely i mean i've served on boards for animal welfare organizations um it that's a huge challenge yeah. a bigger challenge is how we raise chicken and pork mm -hmm. it's really disgusting but we don't see it because we don't see them you know, they're 100% indoors, 100% of their life eating only grain, their whole life. Nothing at all regenerative about pork or chicken production on the industrial level, and it's less nutritious than red meat. Um, but then there's also major issues with how we farm soy, and lots of death, and it's not humane, and the vegetable industry has major child slavery issues. Like there's, there's problems along everything, but because people see cows and think cows look a lot like dogs, we shouldn't treat cows like that. It's the cows that get the focus, but there's awful things that are happening everywhere in every aspect of all food production. So it's, it's all a problem. Yeah, exactly. so, so you mentioned one farm in Mexican that was using regenerative agriculture to produce their cattle mm -hmm. and then sending them to a feedlot. Mm -hmm. So that's a model. 
Yeah, right. So, so even uh, all cattle are grazed on grass, and then they're in America largely finished at feedlots. Right. In other countries, feedlot finished meat is more expensive because you could just keep the cows on grass and it's free, you know. But but because we have all these subsidies and crop insurance programs and everything, it's actually more economical for farmers to, to do it that to do the feedlot system. Um, but even when they're on a feedlot, as I mentioned earlier, um, they still can be upcycling food we have no use for in our food system, the, the corn stocks from the ethanol industry, all these other things. They, cows can turn that into protein, which is amazing. Right, but even if you're you know, doing regenerative ag to get them to the feedlot, mm -hmm. you're doing better for those tracts of land Right. Yeah. No. Her question was specifically like, how do we deal with the feedlot situation? But there are bigger and smaller feedlots. There's better and worse ways of doing everything. To me, the biggest change, or I think that needs to happen, one of the largest consolidations that saw uh, empty shelves during COVID was uh, food processing. Uh, and so these guys, a lot of these farmers are locked into dates where they have to have everything ready, the, either the pigs or the cows or anything like that. And if they get afoul of the food processors in any way, then that date is either canceled or moved or anything like that. So like one, the, for the chicken industry, you have to, if you want to start a chicken farm, you have to sign the contract with, say, Tyson to begin with before you started building anything. You build it to their specifications. You buy the feed from them, you buy the chickens from them, antibiotics from them, you take all the risk, you know, uh, you maybe can get insurance for that. Then you sell it back to Tyson at the price that they determine between the other four companies that they're gonna pay for chicken. So like a 24 hour KFC bucket of chicken, 24.95, the farmer gets 25 cents of that. And so they can only survive for so long living off of this like metrics of, of just increased efficiency and, and building uh, more and more chickens into a more confined space, you know? Uh, but for me, where the rubber hit the road, especially with this, was all of these people invading these farmers and saying these guys are monsters because they are hooked into a system that puts them into total penury. They'll lose not only their job, they lose their, their business, but that's also their family farm. That's their livelihood. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's for us like trying to thread a needle on that and tell all the stories were, it was very difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, especially pro pr processing, it's a big thing, right? Because that became a hyper focus during COVID, right? Everybody was paying attention to that. Yeah, well, back east there was meats were shelves were empty; they were rationing meat. It was mm -hmm. a bit of an eye opener. Yeah. All right, we're, we have to finish the official Q and A. Do you guys want to take more questions in the hallway for yeah, a few sure. minutes, or yeah. so the AB team can wrap up here? Yeah. Thank you.